Ladies and gentlemen, this Red Gaming Center video, we're going to be discussing the PlayStation 4's Audio DSP, also known as the Sound Chip. And we're going to be discussing how it's not only going to benefit the PlayStation 4, but also PCs along with. I'll also point out there is an accompanying article which you can click on in the description, which has a lot of teardowns and analysis and actually has um, various slides from AMD themselves, which actually go into the exact way that um, the actual system functions so you can click on that if you so desire but I've also of course going to be conducting my own analysis here so the PlayStation 4 uh, audio chip hasn't been too forthcoming with detail we of course know that there was a dedicated one inside but we didn't know too much detail about it Microsoft's Xbox One, we know, of course, it was utilizing proprietary Xbox uh, Microsoft technology, but it's only recently that AMD have come about um, when they were actually doing one of their APU conferences, and they were discussing the PS4 just happened to come up, and they basically confirmed that the PS4's audio DSP is based on their true audio technology. So... Um, AMD, of course, have been pretty busy. They've been pushing, for example, the Mantle API as well. And they're also now starting to push accelerated audio processing, dubbed as true audio. Now, traditionally, um, audio processing is actually done on the CPU, in other words, the main processor of the machine. But it's not really the ideal situation because, as it turns out, um, audio processing can be very expensive to run. We'll discuss that more in just a moment. But let's just briefly say that the Xbox 360 could handle six hardware threads and some of the more complicated audio techniques can actually take between one to two hardware threads were actually reserved purely for audio. So that gives you just an understanding on how expensive this can be, um, especially when you consider that a system like the PlayStation 4, you can't just be like, oh, okay, then I'm going to upgrade the CPU in it. It's basically baked in and part and parcel of the system. So, yeah. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the true audio DSP or dig digital signal processor, um, it was actually recently integrated in the recent um, AMD Radeon cards. There would be like the R9s and the R7s, for instance. Now, these actually have a audio chip built into them, the audio DSP, and it is a great example of one of the areas that PCs have kind of been lacking in for a while. Now, some of you may be aware of this, and we actually have to talk about PC before you can understand the benefits of the PlayStation 4, so sorry if it's not exactly your forte, but unfortunately sometimes you have to kind of talk about one subject to understand another. So back in the late 90s and early 2000s, sound card movement, in other words, the advancement in the technology, was moving at a pretty damn fast pace. To give you an idea, it's pretty much keeping up with the Voodoo 2s and the um, TNT cards, in other words, the graphics card industry. But what happened is it took a Windows Vista to the knee. There were other causes as well. For example, um, Realtek were pushing the um, their own codecs and a lot of motherboard manufacturers were including audio uh, processors or basic sound cards into their design as well uh, simply to help to reduce um, well the price and to make it more alluring to customers but back with Windows Vista they made a lot of changes to the sound stack that is to say that the way that the system, the audio, um, actually deals, or should I say the operating system actually deals with audio. Now once again, there are links and a lot more descriptive things in the article. It's just to go through all of it in this video would take uh, quite a long time. So Windows basically, uh, Microsoft basically, for the Windows Vista sound stack, moved a lot of the processing and a lot of the decision making to software. Uh, previously, this was very different. Previously, most of this was actually handled through sound card drivers. But Microsoft had done this for numerous reasons, including trying to make it a simpler process to, for example, program, uh, making it a more 
uniform and smooth experience. They also were trying to reduce latency. There were reasons behind it. It wasn't just, you know, changing it for the sake of changing it. The problem is this pretty much scuppered a lot of dedicated 3D processors at this point because games developers then found it a hell of a lot harder to actually utilize the hardware. Okay, I hear you scream. That's nice, but if you were to look at games now, if you're playing Battlefield, you'll notice that, guess what? You do indeed have 3D audio, and you are, of course, completely and utterly right. Um, as I said during the article, there are some specific slides on this, but you could see that a lot of CPU utilization is being used on audio. And when you consider that the PlayStation 4 has actually less processing power than a high-end desktop, you can see how it makes sense for Sony to say, hey, you know what's a really good idea? To put an actual dedicated processing unit inside this. Now, when you consider that the PlayStation 4's GPU, graphics processing unit, graphics card if you prefer, is pretty damn similar to AMD's latest offerings, um, for example, the R9, in terms of the way compute works, it's not exactly a hop, skip, and a jump away to say, oh, okay, well, it makes sense for them to add and include the audio DSPs. Why? Because, firstly, it's not actually that much extra space on the die. It's pretty small. Secondly, it will definitely benefit the processing of games and audio hardware. So, that's be honest, right now AMD haven't actually, at the time of recording anyway, mid-November, they haven't, uh, 2013, they haven't actually released that much details on the API for the PC version, application program interface, also known as the way that you actually utilize the technology. But I have no doubt that this was a very good thing, in other words, Sony utilizing their technology, because one of the problems with actually creating these standards, which is effectively what they're trying to do with both True Audio and Mantle, and by the way, tomorrow there will be a hell of a lot of stuff on AMD's Mantle technology. I just couldn't do it today. I had quite a lot on with the uh, writing of this article and stuff, but regardless. Um, the problem is, when you create these APIs and these pieces of technology, it doesn't just magically work by, you know, a, a genie coming out of a lamp. Developers need to write specific pathways, specific pieces of code to say, hey, you know what, do this. In other words, they're instruction-based. If you don't have the instructions, the hardware does basically nothing. So, think about it this way. You have a level of parity between the PlayStation 4 and AMD's True Audio. So when you think about that, that means it's not most likely going to be that difficult for a developer, let's just for example say DICE or whomever, to say, okay, we know how this works on the PlayStation, all we have to do is make subtle changes to make it work on AMD hardware. Now, that isn't to say that this is a perfect shiny world, because remember that that's not the only thing you can do. You can't just program specifically for true audio. Why? Because what about those of us who don't have a true audio graphics card? For example, myself who owns a NVIDIA graphics card. What about those of you who own, say, the Radeon R, for example, the 7970, just for example? That doesn't have it either. You can't just go, well, tough shit, you, don't, you know, you guys are fine, you don't need audio for your games, right? Of course not. So they still need to include basic and standard legacy pathways as well to ensure that there's maximum compatibility because obviously they can't um, target the market like 10%, just for example, of PC gamers because that's just not a way to sell your title. And this is pretty similar to the issues that were... Um, around on graphics as well with the GPU APIs or back, for example, with 3DFX with their legacy glide. This is another issue that they're trying to deal with Mantle, but that's a different topic. Uh, very complicated, different topic, may I add. So basic audio calculations used to be quite expensive back when CPUs were um, pretty much like pocket calculators. I'll give you guys a very simple example. I've used this one once before, but when I was playing Half-Life, the original, back on the PC, this was the late 90s, there was, I actually had an integrated um, 
sound card of my motherboard and there was one section of half-life that absolutely used to basically destroy my processor it wasn't the graphics card it was actually this is one area um, and that was like the missile silo area where you have to actually fight this um, monster that's inside it and as it turns out there was so much clanking and banging and reverberation of the sound it basically pretty much made my um, CPU like an asthmatic slug uh, my friend, who actually had a dedicated audio processor in his system, he actually had his creative sound blaster of some description, I don't remember what, but his handled it absolutely fine and dandy. Mine, on the other hand, was just crying, uh, and that was despite the fact that I had a much better GPU than him. Well, GPU, technically they weren't GPUs, because graphics processing was when you're actually dealing with, like, um, triangles and, uh, and lighting and stuff, and back then they were a little bit, little, little less than, like, texture units, really, but whatever. So, my point being that pre-baked audio effects actually aren't that expensive. In other words, just playing a standard sound effect, pew, done. Your sound card can do that, uh, so your, your CPU can handle that pretty simply. What starts to become difficult, though, is when you're actually dealing with multiple 3D effects, particularly when they are not pre-computed, when they are numerous for example imagine that you're in a forest and um you know someone's shooting at you well sound isn't the same if you're in like an open an open i don't know an open field to say an open forest so say for example there's like a wooden bunker sorry uh, a stone bunker in a in a forest and someone's shooting at you from that it's going to sound extremely different than if they're in the regular forest it becomes extremely difficult and complicated and sound engineers have a very limited cpu budget they can't just be like well okay then the amd jaguar inside the playstation 4 can use all of this you know just to run audio no of course not and imagine as well that now we're actually dealing with seven 7.1 surround sound in some cases with say headphones or speakers you can imagine just how quickly that starts to gobble up resources because it's not just a case of well it needs to understand how to play the sound in other words how much reverberation to play does it need to sound a bit uh, a little bit higher pitched maybe more bassy more treble may, maybe it needs uh, some reverberation in there whatever it also needs to then actually figure out what balance on those speakers to actually play it with can you hear it just from the front speakers can you hear it from the back speakers maybe it's a sound that kind of travels for example imagine a plane overhead so it may start on the rear speakers and then eventually go to your front speakers and then maybe a bomb will start coming down and explode to the left of you if you're say playing battlefield and all of these different things going on and so you can have multiple sound effects that will spawn other sound effects and even listening to me, you can hear how complicated this sounds. So imagine your poor CPU trying to do all of this bloody stuff by itself. It is not easy. So AMD have already started to palm this off for games developers for the PC space. Obviously, the fact that now they could also quite happily say, well, it's also for the PlayStation 4 guys, so you know, you're not just programming for one thing and that's it. Which is obviously a really good thing. Now, for the PC, we do actually have a few specifications of the DSP inside it, not all of them, may I add. Um, it's worth noting that the audio DSP inside it is not a traditional sound card, which is pretty big deal for PCs. Why? Because that means that it can do the processing and then send it off to whatever sound output that you are using, be it with the sound card, with the traditional you know, sound, uh, speaker jacks, or it could be, for example, HDMI to the TV, so that would be straight out the graphics card. Or it could be, for example, through the USB ports, if you've got, say, for example, like I have, USB headphones, and so on and so forth. For the PlayStation 4, um, pretty much like all consoles, I've always used these fixed function or these functional processors to help alleviate work from the CPU. Now, the processor um, is actually, and I'm probably going to pronounce this horribly wrong, but as I said, I do have this all in the article anyway. I believe it's pronounced Tensilica Audio DSP. Once again, the spelling is in the article. And it's a pretty much off-the-shelf component. It's actually a mixture of a fixed function and a fully programmable processor. It's kind of like the halfway house. Now, a fixed function processor is pretty simple. It has one job, and that's it. So it doesn't need any instructions, it just does its thing. 
Fully programmable is obviously different. It can be told uh, what it needs to do. Now, this amalgamation means that you've pretty much got a good cost and size ratio. And from what we understand, you're unsurprisingly going to be programming a lot of this using variants of the C language. Um, we don't know everything about this, but it's mostly likely going to be using very long instruction word, also known as VLIW. Um, so on the Radeon cards, we're unsure exactly what's inside the PlayStation 4 as the time I'm recording this, but I imagine it won't be a hop, skip and a jump away. But they basically come with 32KB of both I and D cache, also known as instruction and data cache, as well as an additional 8K of scratch RAM per audio DSP. Also, there's an additional 384 that's available for all of the audio DSPs. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the AMD Jaguar CPU, you'll be aware that that's very similar to how the cores work. There's, for example, two megabytes of level 2 cache per four cores, in other words, per module, and all of the CPUs, or the all four CPUs, can actually access, or all those four CPU cores, and we can actually access this um, this little pool of memory, if you will. For the PC, we also know that it can actually access 64 megabytes of VRAM, video RAM as well, which is quite nice. Strangely enough, and <laughs> I'm pretty shocked about this, but especially when I was reading it initially, but it doesn't matter which of the Radeon cards you go with, so even the low-end ones have exactly the same amount of, of actual audio processing power as these in the high-end ones, which is somewhat surprising. I wouldn't be surprised if there's quite a lot of parity between the PS4 and the um, Radeon processors, simply because, obviously, they certainly need that for the purposes of um, being able to easily port titles over. So there you have it. There are certainly going to be many uses for it. As I said, there are slides and stuff in the article, so you can check those out. It makes it a hell of a lot easier to actually, um, you know, talk about that rather than trying to give you guys every single fact and um, you know, spell everything out for you, quite literally giving you the spelling. There's actually links and stuff to Wikipedia articles or whatever you need there. So, um, for the PlayStation 4, it's going to be hugely beneficial. It was cheap for Sony to implement it, it both in terms of cost to actually buy the bloody thing, in terms of power requirements, and, more to the point, it actually doesn't really take that much um, size on the die. For AMD, it's pretty awesome because it's helping to propel the audio, um, or should I say their API and their technology. For gamers, with your PC gamer, and, you know, you're thinking to yourself, okay, well, you know, we can play in ridiculously high resolutions on PC, you know, we can play triple monitors, we can play, you know, for example, 5760 by 1080p or whatever, we can play in ludicrous resolutions, we can have super high texture quality, but honestly speaking, audios hasn't really improved that much. Even back in the days of the Creative Labs era, when when you had like Sound Blast cards, and this was like back, as I said, mid 2000s or prior, so say you know 2001, 2002, and so on. There was a lot of movement in this, and it just hasn't really done anything since. People have just kind of left it to well wither up and die, if you will. So, once again, this is not new technology. This is just Sony and um, AMD really pushing a new brand of technology. It's going to be pretty awesome, in my honest opinion. It's going to be very beneficial for me as a PC gamer and a console gamer. And it's going to be very awesome for AMD. I have a feeling the games developers are going to be happy for it. I'm just un unsure how many of them are going to actually utilize it fully for the PC, but definitely for the PlayStation 4, it's going to be pretty much a lifeline to try and reduce the processing ability, uh, or should I say, the processing toll. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video, I'll see you soon, take care, bye for now.